Welcome to The Resilient Recruiter. My name is Mark Whitby, and my special guest today is Martin Vanderquack. Martin is a serial entrepreneur in the recruitment industry. He started his first company, Legal Top Talent, while he was still in college. Uh, after completing his MBA at uh, INSEAD, Martin co-founded four companies in four years. So his companies were The Legal Bench, which is focused on contract lawyers, Consultancy Exit, focused on former top-tier strategy consultants, Apollo Executive Search, which focuses on leadership roles for PE-owned and VC-backed companies, and most recently, Matcher, a sourcing and recruitment outsourcing company based in the Ukraine. All companies are profitable, and despite COVID-19 growing, next to running his companies, Martin invests actively in technology companies, and he's a board member of, of several startups. Martin, welcome. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you very much uh, for having me, uh, Mark. I saw an uh, impressive uh, guest list uh, uh, previous uh, to me uh, joining, so uh, I'm honored uh, to to be one of the people on your show. Oh, brilliant. Well, I, I'm honored to have you. It's funny, you and I were chatting before we started recording that um, you didn't like that bio. Your, your business partner, Adrian, wrote it for you because you don't like to sort of uh, blow your own horn, so to speak, uh, and you consider yourself you know, more introverted by nature. Um, how does, you know, it, which may surprise people to hear how successful you've been as an entrepreneur when you consider yourself uh, an introvert. How do you reconcile, you know, being an entrepreneur whilst not being the sort of typical extrovert? Yeah, yeah. It's, um, uh, I recently read about uh, uh, the extrovert introvert. Uh, so, I mean, I can't say that I'm a, that I'm a full introvert, but to, to some extent, indeed, uh, uh, as we discussed, I, I am an introvert. I wrote the first uh, uh, draft of my uh, uh, bio, which I sent to my business partner who said, okay, this is, uh, this is not good. Um, this, uh, this doesn't really reflect what, what, what you've done. Uh, so, uh, I'll rewrite it uh, for you. Uh, so, uh, so I used, uh, that one. Um, so, so I think in general, and that's also already something that I, that I acknowledge, uh, fairly quickly and that I always keep in mind when starting businesses with whom do I start a business? Uh, because, uh, as we, as we discussed some, to some extent, I'm an introvert. I don't like being in front of groups. So, uh, thank you. Thank you for, for having me on a video podcast, uh, actually, uh, Mark, <laughs> where the previous ones, I think, were mostly uh, audio. Um, yeah, but but uh, knowing this about myself, uh, I, I always uh, select people to start a business with that are extrovert and that are good at, at uh, like standing in front of groups and, and motivating people. Uh, I did manage teams myself in strategy consulting, but that's, that's professional services. And, and I think easier uh so so i'm looking for people who have the strength to to complement me which i think is also for them very uh very attractive because uh, uh normally uh, you have two extroverts uh, starting companies and sometimes fighting for for who can be the ceo uh, the good thing is i don't want to be the ceo and i think i'm i'm not the most capable person to be the ceo i'm capable i think of, of starting uh, businesses and getting them profitable, but um, yeah, I, I need other people to complement my skills in order for the companies to be successful. Wow, that's cool. So you're not the CEO of any of your businesses? No, some of the companies don't have an official uh, CEO, so that makes it easier, but I don't consider my, my, uh, uh, myself being the CEO of one of the businesses. All right. So fantastic self-awareness, uh, Martin, and you know, to recognize what your strengths are and where you need people with complementary skills. So you said that your strength is really starting businesses and getting them profitable. Um, could we say a little bit about that? Like, what is it about the startup phase and, you know, getting quickly into profit um, that is attractive to you? Yeah, this is... <laughs> A very interesting question that I've posed myself uh, a lot as well, because um, as starting a business comes with a lot of frustration in the beginning, because you know you have a great idea, uh, but the world uh, just uh, doesn't agree uh, yet. Um, uh, so uh, you get a lot of no's, you get a lot of 
sort of very polite no's. Uh, so uh, come back in the future. And yes, this is very interesting. We should discuss this at a later stage. Uh, but uh, that's just uh, just a polite form of a no. Uh, it, it, it does frustrate me a lot at those uh, times. So I've often wondered uh, why indeed do I do this uh, every time again? I think a lot is about proving that there's something different that, that could work. Uh, and the fact that I that I really believe in it, and then want to show, okay, I'm sure, I'm sure that this could work, and that this could could make the sort of in this in this case most of my active uh, activities as an entrepreneur in the recruitment executive search space, and that things can be better there, and that's especially because I believe in in specialization, and I think within the industry there's there's a severe uh, lack or um, uh, yeah, or a lot of potential for for further specialization and acknowledging that and building businesses there and showing that it works um, is something that that really motivates me despite all the frustrations that uh, that go along with it. So I, I'd like to dive into the issue of specialization in in just a minute. Before we do that. Um, you mentioned to me previously that when you've you're trying to prove a new business model and there's a sort of thrill of starting something new um, and you know bringing you know innovation or creativity to an overserved market like recruitment that gives you energy but you also mentioned it comes with a lot of sort of stress and anxiety like how do you manage the that stress and anxiety because that for a lot of people it can be that can be debilitating and sort of shut down your you know your your uh, potential yeah 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 fair fair question and uh, again also uh, one of the things i'm uh, i'm i'm wondering uh, myself uh, wh- wh- why do i do this every time again if those feelings come but then uh, if the feelings come you still need to cope with uh, with them because there is not really uh, an alternative uh, so I think uh, part of it now is just um, get, get, getting used to it and uh, growing uh, a thick, uh, a thick skin um, uh, in dealing with it. I think on a, on a, um, I think I'm also quite capable at putting things in uh, perspective, uh, both the highs and the lows. Uh, if things are successful, and I think that's also some some part of uh, the perfect perfectionist uh, in myself. And then I think, okay, it's still could and should have been better. Uh, I mean, even if you win various clients in a month, you also always lose various uh, uh, pitches uh, uh, in a month. At least uh, I don't win everything uh, yet. So then I always uh, think about, okay, what what could have been better? So even even, uh, those uh, things, the highs, I can put in perspective, but I think I can also uh, put the lows in perspective, as I said, partly uh, due to experience. And I think also partly... Um, due to the fact that that I do a lot of sports, uh, which which really helps me to sort of unwind. Great, uh, that makes a lot of sense. So, in other words, you don't get over excited or self congratulatory when you win a big account, but neither do you, you know, get take it too hard when you lose a pitch or you have a disappointment. You try and keep a balanced perspective and always analyze. Well, what? How can we improve? What can we do better? Exactly, exactly. And I think the fact that, that the companies are profitable also uh, uh, and are growing uh, also makes it sort of easier uh, now to deal with the setbacks, but especially in the beginning, indeed, it's, it's harder if you're still uh, trying to bring the companies to, to uh, growth and profitability, but indeed the perspective also. Uh, also, if I look at where the companies are now after a few years of entrepreneurship, I still see um, so much potentials and, and things that we should improve that uh, in a way, I'm happy with where we are, but in a way, uh, I'm also uh, not happy because there's still so much to do. All right. Fantastic. So l- mental note to myself, circle back to discuss how to get profitable quickly, because I think this is uh, something I need to learn is um, uh, focusing on profit and not just, I, I enjoy the sales and the marketing and business development. That's my strength, but uh, managing operations and and you know, finances and cash flow is something that I struggle with. Um, and uh, always remembering that if it's not profitable, then it doesn't matter what your sales are because, you know, then it, 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 it's, it's not a successful business. Um, let's talk a little bit about the, 
uh, idea of specialization, you mentioned to me th- that, you know, there's a big difference between sourcing and recruitment. Can you say a little bit about that? Yeah. 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 So that's something that I, that I find uh, very, uh, very interesting. But uh, if, we, if we take it a bit broader eh, and if we look at the, the overall responsibilities of, uh, of, of recruiters or executive search consultants or uh, whatever you want to name it, eh, so you have uh, the sourcing activity, you have to engage candidates, you have to assess candidates, you have to manage clients, you have to manage candidates. Um, it's, it's basically project management, uh, with, with a severe part of, of stakeholder management, but there, those are so many different type of activities. Uh, I sometimes compare the industry to, uh, if you would look at the production facility and if you would have so many different activities in a production facility, you would have a, a dedicated person for each and every activity. And <laughs> what do we do in this industry? Uh, we say to one person, okay, these are all the activities, please uh, go ahead and be successful at all of them. And if we specifically, uh, with Metro, we specifically picked out of all the responsibilities, the sourcing part. And if you look at, at sources and recruiters, uh, uh, very often sourcers have a very technical background, more a data-oriented background. Um, have what they need to do is is uh, very different from what a recruiter needs to, to do to be successful. At Metro, we say we find people and we turn people into candidates. So we are good at, at market mapping and globally finding the right talent that fits the requirements of our clients, but finding them and then uh, reaching out to them for which we use over 90 platforms. We use over 20 tools uh, to try to be successful. Uh, we try to distinguish ourselves with our conversion rates. And that's a lot of uh, about A-B testing with messages, with, uh, with tooling to see how can we be successful. And so that's the sourcing part. But then if we look at the recruiting part, uh, when we hand it over to our clients, we need to turn those candidates into hires. It's a lot about building relationships, uh, selling the company, managing the process, uh, both on the uh, uh, internal side as on the external side with the clients. And those require such fundamentally different skills that that I do not really understand why many companies still have all these responsibilities uh, within their own recruitment team without specialization within the team. Wow, that's interesting. I love the analogy of a production facility and, you know, which it's just logical, right? If you're manufacturing, you know, in the aerospace industry or in the automotive industry, you don't have the same person doing, you know, the design, the production, the engineering, the, you know, all the different parts of the process, right? Those exactly. are different people. Exactly. Um, and in recruitment, we do. Right, yeah. in recruitment, right. We do all, you have one person doing all those different jobs. So how can they possibly do them all, you know, equally well when they're different skill sets? I hadn't thought of it quite that way before. That's uh, interesting. <laughs> yeah. And that has nothing to do with, with, with uh, I mean, the quality of the people or whatever. But some, uh, as I mentioned, I, I, I'm not good at, at being a, a CEO. Eh? So that's why I'm also not every, uh, uh, everything myself. Uh, depending on the stage uh, the company is in, I'm doing a lot myself. But but uh, the further the businesses grow, the more I can focus on on what I'm good at. And I think that's that's really a development that uh, is being made within the industry with with various firms, uh, especially firms that have the skill uh, to do so. But I think that's also where still so much potential lies within the industry. Because the good thing is not only you're putting um uh, hey you're getting focus on activities which will improve the results but also people will be happier because people will be uh happiness and being good at your job uh, tends to be uh, correlated so uh with uh, recruiters doing sourcing what they don't like doing uh, they will most likely not be very good at it especially also as as it's not their dedicated task but they will also not be happy doing it, which again has impact on your retention, et cetera. So what we do by sort of having companies outsource the sourcing process is both making the process better and more efficient, but also making the 
uh, recruiters uh, happier. And what we see is that 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 if we work with freelance recruiters at at uh, um, uh, the the companies we work with, and they move to a different company, they say, "Hey, we want to take Matcher uh, along again." Uh, because they think, okay, they make my life better because I get a lot of sourced candidates and I can focus on what I like doing and what I'm good at, managing everything internally to get to hires as soon as possible. All right. That's cool. Yeah, I, I like the analogy. So how does this apply in different contexts? For example, you've got a contract recruiting business, you have an executive search business. Um you know, how does this concept of specialization and trying to remove the redundancy from different tasks apply in those contexts? Yeah, yeah, good question. So my uh, knowledge also developed over the years, uh, Mark. So it wasn't uh, all there uh, 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 when I when I started uh, uh, that I was sure uh, what I exactly wanted to do and how to build uh, the businesses, so the idea of Matcher basically came from uh, Apollo uh, Executive Search, uh, so the company with which we do uh, C-level hires for private equity-owned uh, and venture capital-backed uh, companies. Uh, so basically what we do there is we hire people, we mostly work uh, with people with a business background, um, as I think for the, for the C-level roles, it's very important that people really understand uh, what does a business do? What are the challenges in a business? And that the people that hire you consider you your potential peers. Uh, so we hire people with a business background that tends to be um, that tend to be uh, more expensive as well. Uh, so clarify sorry. what you mean, Martin. Which is when you say you hire people, do you mean people to work at Apollo Executive Search? Yeah. Yeah, so okay. our executive search consultant. So, so I mean, our first hire, for example, um, uh, he studied at Harvard. Uh, he did a PhD. He worked at the NATO uh, in international diplomacy. Uh, as so not your traditional uh, background. Our uh, most recent hire worked in consulting, was uh, CFO at the SaaS firm, uh, and then then switched to uh, to Apollo. Uh, but that's that's the kind of people that that we hire. Uh, and those people, uh, where do we see that their strength uh, lies and what did we notice in uh, dealing with clients, in dealing with candidates, because the clients and the candidates consider them their peers. And that's something that's that's very hard to, to replicate if you don't have that background. So uh, we noticed, okay, that's where their core strength lies. And then we looked at the whole process that we had. And then uh, it's, it's the interaction with clients and candidates is one part of it. But finding them is another part of it. So we uh, ask ourselves the question, uh, are they the right people to find those candidates? And we said, well, actually, their time is better spent on what they're really good at. So then we looked into the market. So we thought, okay, we can outsource the sourcing and market mapping part of, of the job. Uh, but looking into the market, we came either to sort of uh, the freelance solution via Upwork or whatever, which is often very cost effective, but not sustainable. And often uh, as something is, most of the times things are cheap uh, for a reason because the, the output is also uh, in line with the price. Uh, so that was one option uh, which we were not happy with. And then, then on the higher end, you also had some solutions uh, which tended to become very expensive because they wanted the percentage of our fees and you know what the fees are like in executive search. So then it became too expensive for us to work on that model. So we basically noticed, hey, why is there not sort of a sustainable sourcing solution that helps us in sourcing, that helps us in market mapping, but that has the cost structure that is more or less in line with hiring someone ourselves. So basically the challenge we had at Apollo uh, was the input for the ID for Matcher. And that's that's when when we started uh, Matcher. Got it. Uh, so Matcher was actually born out of a need that you discovered within your executive search business, which yeah. is that you've got a client facing, a high level client facing, you know, executive search consultant, someone who's with a PhD from Harvard isn't the same person or someone from a consulting background, isn't someone who should be sending LinkedIn messages to candidates to try and get them to start a conversation and that sort of thing. It's not maybe the best use of their, of their time. Exactly. And or, for two reasons, 
the, the, the results uh, will not be as good as someone who's doing it 100% of his or her time because yeah. the specialization has, has, I think you have the 10,000 hour uh, rule about activities. Yeah. Uh, and also, if you have those people do sourcing on LinkedIn 24-7, uh, uh, within a month, they will be at your desk saying, okay, I'm not sure I like my job. Uh, right. which which uh, would again also be a big pain for us so they can do what they're good at and what they like. Great. Oh, that makes total sense. I like it. So th there is another, I mean, there is a big already um, sort of offshore resourcing um, industry, if you like. Uh, you know, a lot of companies in India, for example, which provide this sort of service. Is that, uh, is that something that you evaluated before trying to like, or tested before setting up Matcher? Yeah. Yeah. So we tested several solutions indeed uh, out of India and out of Asia. And what we mainly notice is that the quality is not in line with what you would want as a, as, yeah, sort of uh, the standard that, that we have with our clients. So there are indeed various initiatives, but none of which uh, really convinced me about the value add that they provided. We also looked at, of course, automation, because if you look at, uh, at sourcing, uh, the biggest threat is, of course, that sourcing will be automated. And there are so many companies uh, telling about their uh, AI, and because everything needs to be AI uh, these days, otherwise it's not tech. Um, yeah, so an AI solution to do uh, automated matching and uh, reduce the need for, for the sourcer. And actually with uh, Booking.com uh, uh, was, was one of our biggest uh, clients uh, pre-corona. Pre uh, and with, with Booking, we also did a test that we said, okay, we identified uh, one, one tool which we thought, okay, this might work very well for the automated matching which had a lot of marketing around it and was supposed to be a sort of state of the art. The results were disappointing. Uh, it was so, and that's, that has been my experience with all AI automation uh, yet. Uh, there's uh, a lot of good marketing about it, uh, around it, but if the results would be in line with the marketing, uh, Matcher would be redundant. Uh, but, but so far, uh, nothing has, has convinced me yet. And I think... Uh, what we're doing still has a lot of value and uh, and uh, there are other companies looking into the, the sourcing space, but it's such a huge space as so many companies have not identified sourcing as a dedicated skill yet. Um, I think competi competition is only good. Uh, it means that there is a market uh, and it will make the market e efficient. Okay, that's a good way of looking at it. Re regarding the automation tools and so on, though, Martin, could... Would it not be fair to say that like where automation is right now is like where the Wright brothers were when they, you know, were first created the first airplane, right? <laughs> so, you know, that it's very basic um, yeah. and, you know, is not going to perform as well as uh, a team of intelligent human beings based in uh, the Ukraine. But, you know, maybe in 20 years, uh, it could be a whole different, you know, whole different thing. Yeah. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And that's uh, uh, indeed, uh, I mean, uh, though I think I read somewhere that AI was first mentioned in the in the 80s, there was discussion around it. Uh, so if you would then see where are we 40 years uh, uh, later, it's it's also not, uh, not uh, that impressive. But there are, of course, various um, uh, industries in which AI has proven like extremely uh, efficient and successful. Yeah. So indeed, in 20 years in the recruitment space, AI might be very successful. Uh, so I fully agree with you there. Um, if we make the comparison to the Wright brothers, if we look at AI and automated matching, uh, uh, I think um, if, if the planes would have been uh, in line with where AI and automation is now, I would not recommend anyone to uh, to jump aboard of the plane and try to cross the... Uh, <laughs> yeah, you uh, want to be the first cannot. passenger on that plane. <laughs> exactly. I wouldn't want to be the passenger. Um, yeah, but but uh, still, also with tooling, there are still a lot of uh, ground to gain with tooling. Eh? So we are using over 20 tools, but and and our automation tooling really brings us a lot, but it's, it's still all on the process side. So making our processes much more efficient and there we are gaining, um, I think in the tens of percentages uh, per year in terms of, of efficiency. And there are very smart uh, 
uh, tools for, for outreaching campaigns, emailing, database management, uh, etc. Uh, but if you look at the matching part, that's where there's still a lot of ground to cover. Okay, interesting. So you said you, you use uh, 80 different platforms, 20 different tools. What part do you use, let's say, uh, a tool for versus what part does a human being uh, still do? Um, yeah, so basically we indeed look at, uh, at, uh, at the whole process and see where uh, does a human uh, add value. Uh, so of course, uh, in the in the technical sourcing part and combining uh, various various databases, uh, you get you get a lot of value from from tooling because we are um, um, faster with finding pools of candidates and also better at getting more elaborate knowledge on those. Candidates, so that's that's where we use tooling. But then there needs to be uh, a person, uh, a uh, of course, in the beginning to do the input to get the tools to work. But then also to assess the output uh, of the tools to see, okay, what's the output that we can really work with. And so every time there's a judgment, then there's there's a person uh, again that really needs to be involved. After that, you get to the outreach phase and in the outreach phase again there's a lot of tooling that you can do in terms of uh, automated uh, we we work with uh, semi-personalized automated outreaching so there's a especially for tech profiles you need a high degree of personalization to successfully engage them so yep. we invest a lot there but then we try to be smart in uh, leveraging uh, tools to to sort of again be be more efficient with it uh, we experiment a lot also now with video outreaches uh, because it's it's sort of new and to see okay what what uh, effects will that have so uh, then again in outreaching in following up in managing candidates that's again uh, where we use the tooling if we start interacting with candidates i think there's also where ai is getting better and i've seen some solutions uh, <laughs> most of them very expensive, of course, that in the conversational part are getting uh, somewhere, which, which I, I consider interesting. But that's, we, we still do this mostly ourselves. Okay. Uh, so in all, uh, in judgment and in candidate facing activities, we, we do it ourselves. Underlying processes, we try to automate as much as possible. Got it. So let me just clarify. So the actual... Um, Researching to identify candidate pools, you use automation tools there, but of course a human needs to set set it going right to yeah. um, to kick off the process. Then also uncovering more insight and data for those candidates. So you know contact information or you know stuff like that. You can use automation. Yeah. Um, then the outreach, you can you can semi automate that. Uh, but then ultimately, someone still has to decide, like, look at the data set and decide which ones are the right candidates to approach and then um, set up the automation campaign. And then, you know, the actual matching part still, that's a human process then. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That's, that's still a human process. And that's where I found all tools. And as it's uh, such a big threat for it, for the potential threat uh, to our business. Um, we, we test with a lot of them to see what's out there. Uh, and that's where, where I think the market still has a long way to go. Okay. Let's talk about, uh, this is a tangent, but um, video outreach, I'm experimenting with that as well. What are your, what are your findings? How, um, how successful has it been? Yeah, uh, so my uh, co-founder uh, Adrian uh, gave uh, gave a speech uh, on this on the on the sourcing uh, summit, uh, where where he explained. Uh, so he did uh, basically the the testing uh, of of this whole um, uh, video outreaching uh, campaign, uh, where we uh, learned uh, a lot of lessons uh, in the beginning, uh, because taping the video it sounds very straightforward uh, basically what you do as a as a reach out message uh, you just uh, tape it you send it out and um, we expect uh, success uh, fortunately uh, it uh, didn't prove that uh, that straightforward yet uh, so in the beginning we had opening uh, opening rates of uh, i think it was below 40% uh, response rates uh, even even much lower. Uh, so uh, we had a lot of difficulty in getting 
A, it's in front of the people's eyes and then B, B uh, getting them to engage with it. Uh, but that's where we uh, slash Adrian uh, learned a lot about, okay, how do we, what can we do? And again, tooling was very helpful there to ensure that it doesn't end up in spam, uh, to ensure it's sent at the most appropriate time uh, so that we get people to read it and then testing with what do you do to engage people. Uh, so something very nice that is done, but but uh, yeah, you should watch the Sourcing Summit video also, which goes into detail about it, is also there you have tooling that helps you to personalize the video outreach. So then um, uh, Adrian was able to uh, record a video where he would send to you, uh, hey, Mark, and then uh, in your screen, you would see your own LinkedIn picture. He would point uh, to you and refer to what you're doing. And you would think, wow, uh, how did he do that? Uh, we also offer to show the value of our, our sourcing. We offer free uh, sourcing uh, seminars to, to potential clients or people who just want to see what we do of one or two hours in which we show how sourcing works. For those invites, we send sort of a Zoom uh, conference like we are in now. And then you would see the third photograph, which would be a photograph of that person in LinkedIn saying, hey, shouldn't we be on a Zoom call with the three of us? Uh, to discuss how we could do sourcing. So again, that's where it's a combination that we need to identify uh, that Mark Whitby is a relevant uh, contact for us. But tools then again help us to engage you. So you can see, hey, this is really a personal thing or I like what they're doing and maybe I should engage with those guys. Yeah, absolutely. That's cool. I, I've certainly found, because I'm experimenting with it as well, and I think it's important that the video has the person's, either their website, their LinkedIn profile, and their name and their picture is prominent so they know that this video is especially for yeah. them. Otherwise, they just think it's a generic, you know, marketing video. They don't realize, without clicking play, they don't realize that you've actually taken the time and trouble to make this video especially for them. So there has to be some visual clue yeah. in the, and there has personal. to be a thumbnail of the video that they can see if it's just a link they're probably not gonna not gonna click it so uh, has it been successful for you uh, mark uh, so far um i'm in i'm very interested in it um i haven't measured it like you have i'd be interested to see is the the talk that adrian did is that available or yeah. is that I'll, I'll share it with you uh, and potentially you can also add it in the in the comments when you post this podcast if more people would find it relevant yeah, I would love to see that because my clients are, I'm telling my clients, look, try this because it's still new enough that, yeah. um, you know, I think eventually it will become normal. Yeah. But right now you can gain an advantage in getting engagement from candidates or clients. We use it for business development as well. Yeah. Um, and, uh, but my testing is so limited. I can't really say definitively that this works. Yeah. Um, it's just an idea that I, I like. Um, because intuitively, it seems like it should work, right? Yeah. But um, so I, I, I'll, I'll watch Adrian's video. That's cool. Yeah, and, and there, there's one thing about it because I agree with you that uh, it's new and it's, it's uh, different and you can really personalize and speak to the person, which I think would be much more efficient. What we, what we are facing in, in Kiev is that not everyone is fully comfortable uh, using it, also from yes. sort of privacy considerations. Uh, they are not... Not all of them are, are very keen to be exposed with a video of themselves uh, towards a, a candidate. Maybe some people on the recipient side will also consider it uh, intrusive. Uh, not, not sure yet. I think time will tell. But I, I, I mean, I think conceptually it's extremely interesting. And with Matcher, we really invest in, in tooling and trying to stand out. So it's, it's really something we want to move on with. Yeah, absolutely. No, that's cool. We, um, the, the sort of personalized outreach tool that I use, uh, is called interseller. I don't know if you've looked at that one, but, um, I've, uh, my clients are getting good results with that where, but it has to use the personalization. If it's just a mass message yeah. that that just goes either it gets deleted or ignored. So there has to be, um, we, we call it automation at scale. It has to, which takes longer. It's easier just to press send and send out hundreds of messages to which are the same, but yeah. then 
you're not going to, the response will be disappointing. So it takes a little longer to sp- set up the automation, you know, and, but I always tell people, even if it takes two or three minutes per email uh, to, um, you know, to look at the person's LinkedIn profile or the website or find something relevant to say that's unique to them, then it, the, the corresponding increase in response will, will be worth the extra effort. Yeah. When we started with Metro, we uh, we did uh, so so especially we targeted the, the, the international tech domain. And so when we started, we had targets of people approaching between 100 and 200 people uh, per day, uh, okay. with with more a mass outreach campaign with like yeah one one twist uh, uh, the, the 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 name and 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 something uh, something straightforward about the job or whatever yes. had to be uh, to be sent out. Now our people are on sort of um, uh, between twenty and thirty outreaches uh, per day, uh, so much lower. But the absolute output is much higher because we really invest in the personalization, like uh, finding out what uh, what are their interests on Instagram, referring to those interests with something that is new in that space. Uh, but then again, we're looking at, because you need to build skill in the operation, as, as you mentioned, uh, rightfully so. Uh, so then we try to cluster uh, people with, uh, with a similar interest and with underlying process efficiency. Uh, still, still try to get to, um, yeah, we, we call it a sort of semi-personalized automation uh, to, to still show people we know who you are, but also um, yeah, ensure we are efficient in our processes. Right. Okay. It makes total sense. Uh, uh, interesting. So um, there's a couple of things we kind of skipped over. Like we jumped straight in Matcher because that's yep. like, obviously you're passionate about it and, um, <laughs> and it is very relevant. But um, I, I did want to just talk about your kind of earliest startups. Why did you go into recruitment in the first place? <laughs> yeah, I, I always say to people, uh, Mark, uh, if... Uh, uh, so, so when I was uh, when I was very young, I was taken uh, one of my um, father's best friend. He was uh, a partner at uh, Allen and Overy. Uh, I don't know if you know it. It's one sorry, of the, partner at Allen and Overy. Okay, uh, one of the largest um, global law firms. Uh, I studied both law and economics, uh, and um, yeah, my goal was to be uh, a partner in a law firm uh, as soon as uh, as possible. Uh, <laughs> then, when I started doing economics, I I, um, I liked that and the mathematical component of it of it much more. So I dropped uh, the law ambition and. Uh, more started to look into strategy consulting. And if at that time you would have told me that uh, in 10 years I would be an entrepreneur in uh, recruitment, uh, I would have uh, uh, considered everyone uh, crazy uh, who would be, who would be uh, telling me uh, this. Uh, yeah, so how did I end up here? Uh, it's basically, I think I, I like people. I like to see what drives people. I like to see people uh, in the right uh, in the right place. And uh, though uh, that's why I said I'm an extrovert introvert. I'm good at getting in in contact with people, but uh, it shouldn't be the whole day. Uh, but but with one of uh, the law firms, I was on a business trip to uh, to New York when I was still a student. Uh, I was quite active uh, as a student in different societies, uh, both more on the social and more on the content side. And then the law firm basically asked me, uh, okay, uh, so I studied in Groningen in the northern part of the Netherlands and uh, most of the students in Groningen are more uh, known for their uh, sort of uh, enjoying student life uh, part of uh, of their student time than than on uh, being so much uh, driven uh, to get a a very good job very uh, very soon. Uh, So this law firm also had difficulties finding people with good grades, good social skills, and a strong content drive. So I was on that course also the only student from Groningen. So they said, okay, we need more people like you. Uh, Where do we find that? And then I thought, okay, uh, if they are looking for it, it it apparently has value for them. So I said, okay, I can help you with that. But then, uh, of course, it comes at a price. Uh, And uh, to my surprise, they said, okay, uh, we can do that. So then basically I started um, recruiting people out of my own network who I considered uh, good and capable for that, for that law firm. Uh, and that's, uh, that was uh, from my Hotmail address with my personal phone and some of it was, uh, was at the bar. So it was very uh, sort of opportunity. <laughs> 
opportunity driven that I got people uh, into that law firm. But then over time, it seemed to work quite well. I think various uh, things in my approach uh, and how I dealt with people and especially, and that's also the idea behind Apollo, uh, people considered me their peer because I went into the same law firms. I went to the same trips. So they knew, okay, he knows what he's talking about. So that's why people like working with me. And I, I really put emphasis on the, on the longer term relationship. I think in one of your previous podcasts, you also discussed the, the, the customer lifetime perspective, uh, which is all often overlooked in, in recruitment. So I think there was a combination of things that, that attracted me with the opportunity. And then at some point I noticed that, that the company was actually making uh, quite good money. Uh, so then I considered continuing that uh, directly out of university. But I still thought like having having a normal job would have value for me. So I went into uh, international strategy consulting uh, because I thought, okay, I see, I will see a lot of industries. I will have a lot of exposure to very interesting clients, see how businesses are run, et cetera. And I thought I keep my business on the side. Uh, and even though the working hours in consulting are uh, are very bad, uh, I still managed to to keep this keep this on the side. I liked doing it on the side. Then went to INSEAD and after INSEAD or at INSEAD, I thought, okay, uh, because the, the company paid for my MBA. Uh, so I thought, okay, I need to go back for, for some time to ensure this, this debt is, uh, is paid off. And I thought I could still still learn, learn a lot at the company. And I liked it, but I decided, okay, I don't want to be a partner in here. I want to see whether I can be an entrepreneur because many people say, okay, I think I can start a business and I think I can be successful. And I had this business, which was doing okay. Uh, but it's easy to say, okay, I could have made a business out of it, but you can only find out by trying. So I thought, okay, uh, after INSEAD, I go back and then I will, I will try uh, to see whether this business can, can really work and whether I can get it flying. Uh, and I had a standing return offer, et cetera. So in the end, and then it already made, made quite a decent living. So, so the, uh, we discussed it also before. Uh, I thought at that time it was a big step uh, in retrospect. I think it was actually a very small step because the government is also not very capital uh, intense. So then I went out and started, um, or um, uh, the, the, this first business of mine, Legal Top Talent, uh, I elaborated, uh, I, or um, I expanded it. I hired a general manager to, to further uh, strengthen the business and, and really manage the business. And for myself, I then, um, yeah, if you have the time, then you see so many different opportunities. So actually, and because I was in recruitment, I saw a lot of opportunities in recruitment. And that's basically how first... Uh, the legal bench uh, got going because I saw, okay, many uh, people leave law firms again, but they leave law firms uh, and not necessarily because they don't like the work, but most of it because they don't like the environment and the hours that they work and how they're pushed and how uh, in, in professional service firms, they say people are our most important assets, but they treat them as assets and not as people. Uh, and with the legal bench, we thought, okay, you have these very capable lawyers that like the work of, uh, like doing the work of being a lawyer, but don't want to be in that firm. And on the other side, you have these clients that want high quality lawyers, but don't always, or preferably don't want to pay what they, uh, what they are paying their very expensive law firms. So what if we get the people from those very expensive law firms who are not there anymore, but got the education to those clients, uh, that would be a more efficient market. So that business started. Got it. So yeah. you were placing contract lawyers, not with the law firms. They were, you were placing them with corporate clients. Uh, it's a combination because okay. the, because uh, as the law firms are losing so many uh, people because they are not capable of retaining them, then sometimes they come back to us and say, okay, yeah, those people that are working as a contract lawyer now, actually, uh, we have a shortage in our own teams. Got so it. could we get one of your people in our team? So they are also our clients, but I think partly they are our clients because they are not good at managing their internal human capital. Um, right. Interesting. So Martin, I've never met anybody who started a recruitment business as a side hustle while <laughs> at university and then continued. You, so you're working full time as a strategy consultant and you kept your recruiting sort of thing as a sideline initially. Yeah. 
Yeah, so I did it in the weekends and uh, when I was, um, so I was one of the people who didn't mind really the traveling, etc. So when I was on an international assignment that was somewhere else in the world, it was also quite okay for me because then you had uh, limited social distraction. So I had more time to, to work on my business. Wow. So interesting. Now, um, these different businesses, are they really sort of, I'm trying to understand the structure because are they really just different brands with the same team or are they completely kind of different companies with different people working at them? Yeah. So it's mostly, so uh, legal top talent and the legal bench are sort of in a way related that the first one gets people into law firms and the second one gets people out of law firms. Okay. Uh, if we would say it's very uh, direct. Uh, they have they have different teams, different people. Then I started consultancy exit, which was basically meant to uh, find new jobs for former top tier strategy consultants. Ah. That's the firm where we where we started hiring people with a with a business background. But because we hired people with a business background, we fairly quickly got the question from private equity firms and venture capital firms. Uh, saying, hey, you are one of the first search companies in the Netherlands where um, we don't pay the like really high-end executive uh, search fees um, uh, of, the, of, the, of the major international uh, players, but where we do get the people with a business background. So if we explain to you guys our portfolio after the con uh, conversation, you still remember what the portfolio is and you understand what the challenges are. So couldn't you also help us with the managerial roles in your portfolio? Because we, we like working uh, with you guys and we think you understand what we're doing. So then we started to do CEO, CFO, CO, CMO, CCO level searches, but all from the brand consultancy exit. But then you start to get referrals and then uh, you get a referral. So someone says, okay, I'm looking for a CFO. And one of our clients would say, okay, you should contact uh, Martin, uh, who's at Consultancy Exit. But then the guy getting the referral would say, yeah, yeah, but I don't need a former strategy consultant. I need a CFO. Uh, and then we needed to explain, okay, the name is still Consultancy Exit, but... Uh, uh, and we do have not only former consultants, we have a large CFO pool with a relevant uh, functional and industry background as well. So that's that's when at some point uh, we swapped sort of, or, or we added a front end uh, basically, which is Apollo Executive Search. Also very interesting because if you name a business Executive Search, everyone takes it ser more seriously. Uh, sure. Because, because it has Executive Search behind it. Uh, I found it very interesting when we launched the brand and we still had the same activities. I got so many connection proposals from CEOs, CFOs, CEOs, et cetera, that I thought, okay, I'm still the same guy, but overnight I, I added the brand. Uh, and so consultancy exit and Apollo are sort of uh, with the same team, same business owner. Apollo focuses on C-level searches, consultancy exit still only focuses on former uh, strategy consultants Got it. for different jobs. So that's that's the same um, team, those two. And then Matcher came out of what we noticed at Apollo, uh, but I started um, uh, Matcher with Adrian. Adrian, I first tried to recruit him for Apollo. I've known him for a long uh, time, and I always uh, thought he would be a, a good addition for one of my teams. Uh, but he wanted to be an entrepreneur, which I also understood. And then, then it coincided when I saw this business opportunity with Matcher. And when Adrian actually, from a different perspective, also identified that opportunity and he said, yeah, I think uh, because he left his, his uh, previous job uh, um, as, as a partner at a, a digital recruitment firm. And we were still in a lot of, of talks, not only for getting into Apollo, but also on a personal level. And at some point he said, yeah, I'm looking into uh, building a sourcing business. And then I said, well, this is very interesting because with Apollo, this is exactly what we're facing. Uh, so shouldn't we start this uh, together? All right. Awesome. So the uh, Apollo executive search and consultancy exit, separate brands, different websites and so on. But they're uh, behind the scenes. They're, they're, it's the same team who are filling jobs on either, yeah. either side. Um, and we have people distributed over the teams eh, because the Apollo roles uh, really require uh, different different profiles. Consultancy Exit also still uh, requires very strong uh, strong profiles, but in the end, it's 
it's slightly different, but in the end also it's it's um, uh, related because private equity firms uh, with Apollo, they might look for a new CEO, but then when the CEO starts, uh, he or she needs an assistant to the CEO, like a very smart guy or girl uh, who would be able to help them on their, their key st- uh, strategic uh, challenges. Uh, and then Consultancy Exit could provide them with an assistant to the CEO, uh, who's a former consultant and known to this boardroom uh, work. So it sounds from what you, uh, in our previous conversation, uh, Martin, that uh, Matcher was really gaining momentum and then COVID hit. Your biggest client um, was Booking.com in the, in the travel you know, technology space. And obviously they must have been affected. What has happened with Matcher during COVID and how, what adjustments have you had to make? Yeah, so um, indeed... Uh, <laughs> Uh, we we were always very happy. Booking was one of our first clients, so then we were all still uh, figuring uh, figuring out uh, the business model, uh, what works, uh, what doesn't work, and Booking helped us a lot in that. And I think uh, we also helped uh, help Booking, of course. Uh, and they were a very loyal uh, client. We had them on board for more than a year, and they were uh, a flagship brand uh, to us with. And we're still in very good relations uh, with them. But when COVID hit and they had a huge internal recruitment team, but no roles. Uh, so when you have an internal recruitment team uh, for whom it's a challenge of, okay, what am I going to do tomorrow? Then like your external partners is okay. But if we don't know what our own team is going to do, what are our partners going to do? Uh, so, um, yeah, we had a lot of exposure to booking, which was great pre-COVID, uh, but uh, proved a, a challenge during COVID. We had another uh, large uh, scale client in travel. Uh, we had Accenture, uh, which is a global technology company, but Accenture was also hit very hard when, when COVID hit because many of their projects were put on hold. Uh, as everyone was managing cash flow. Uh, so that also uh, directly proved quite a challenge for Matcher. As you said, we were having a lot of uh, momentum. We were hiring a business developer uh, for, for the US market uh, because um, Adrian lives part of his time in New York. Um, I was in uh, uh, New York uh, so, um, uh, right before uh, Corona hit and we had various meetings that proved very fruitful. So we thought, okay, at the US is a huge market and also uh, resources are even more expensive. So we can be very cost efficient, but also uh, uh, the sourcing focus is still something that is not um, like very mature in the US. So we can also bring a lot of sourcing value at uh, competitive price level. So we thought, okay, this, this should be interesting. Uh, we had a lot of momentum and we thought, okay, this is where we can grow. Uh, then COVID hit and, uh, yeah, well, as I said, we, we had some clients, uh, facing tough times. Uh, so then the challenge for us was, okay, uh, we need to adapt. Uh, so now we are losing a lot of revenues. Um, uh, our cost levels are the same, but uh, we spent uh, a lot of time training our people. We have a very capable and um, coherent uh, team with, I think, a very good culture, atmosphere, etc. So, yeah, so we thought, okay, uh, how, uh, like everyone, how long is this going to last? Because if the market picks up again, uh, we want to have uh, um, many capable people because if our clients come back, then uh, we, we uh, like in growth, you often face uh, these challenges of, okay, so now I have a new client, but I don't have people. Uh, so it was all the time, okay, we have a new client, oh shit, but we don't have people. So now we need to we need to find people. So in a way we thought, okay, now we finally can have a bench, which we were never able to have. Uh, but yeah, with COVID, is it good to have a bench and how much do you want on the bench? So we needed to make this trade-off. Okay, how many people can we keep within the team uh, versus uh, remaining financially stable? Uh, so this was this was something something we really struggled with, and then we took the decision to keep on as many people as possible and invest in our in our people uh, to keep them on board. I think one of the things that we did well is that uh, ever since we started Mature, 
uh, we've always been extremely transparent to our people about uh, how is the company doing. We shared our financial performance on a monthly basis and like everything about the financial performance. So people also understood directly what happened when COVID hit, which, which was which was also very good for their engagement. Uh, but we needed to balance, and, and as I said, we decided to keep more people on than was than was financially uh, the, the 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 optimal uh, ID. Um, and that's I mean uh, laying people off uh, during COVID when you know it will be hard for recruiters to find a new job. Uh, it's also not something that you like to do uh, with people that that's helped your company uh, grow and helped you uh, develop your your brand. Uh, especially social security, social security is of course also different in different in in, in um, Ukraine than in many other uh, countries. Fortunately, uh, many of them um, uh, quickly found a job. So in, in the end, that that didn't turn out uh, that bad. Uh, but it was really a struggle for us to decide, okay, how many people can we keep on and then how many people do we uh, need to let go? And then very quickly we signed uh, TikTok. So we were able to, some of the people we said, okay, we need to uh, let you go. And uh, we could say, uh, yeah, sorry, we also didn't expect this, but uh, we actually need you back. Are you still willing to move back? Uh, and now we see um, we see part of the market uh, that we're serving uh, getting uh, getting in need again. So now we're we're hiring uh, we're hiring again, and now it proved a, g- a good choice uh, what we did. But at that time, we of course weren't sure whether it was the the right choice to keep on so many people. But now we're facing the problem uh, again of uh, uh, getting clients on board and not having people, especially as we also launched uh, the new remote hiring uh, proposition. Uh, and which which then again proved an uh, opportunity uh, of COVID because Ukraine has many, uh, has a very attractive tech market. Uh, there are many uh, very uh, motivated, capable uh, developers uh, who can be hired for very reasonable prices and um, uh, are very good and, and motivated uh, for, for, for what they're doing. Uh, and we've told that to uh, other companies before, like, shouldn't you build a team in, uh, in, uh, in Ukraine? We can help you set it up. And then they always said, yeah, no, we don't want to manage uh, remote employees. We don't think it will work. Uh, and then, uh, then COVID were <laughs> has started and uh, everyone was a remote employee. So our clients in Amsterdam with their, with their employees living, living sort of uh, 100 meters uh, from, from the office were still... Uh, remote employees and uh, people found out especially in the tech domain that many developers even were more productive working from home working remote uh, than working in the office so uh, then we saw a lot of momentum for for remote teams so now we also uh, actively moved into uh, into into that space like helping companies that that now see that hey um, I can have a long time. Uh, it can take me a long time to find someone expensive, uh, medium capable uh, in Amsterdam, or I can find uh, someone fast in Kiev uh, who's more motivated uh, at, 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 at um, yeah, a more cost efficient uh, level. Uh, so now we help them build remote development, remote data science teams, uh, science teams uh, in Kiev. Uh, and and we don't do outsourcing, so we don't take the outsourcing premiums. They are your employees. You manage them. Uh, we uh, you pay us a, a fixed fee for for setting uh, the team up, building it. We can help you with the operations, etc. But those are just your remote employees, and that's that's now proving something that's that's very valuable at these times. Interesting. Wow. So you pivoted quickly to. Um... Were you already planning that or was this an opportunistic thing of, you know, helping companies set up remote uh, teams in, in Kiev? Yeah, we, we were planning it. We were discussing it, it but also because the sourcing business was was um, yeah, uh, growing so fast and, and required so much of our attention, we uh, spent too little time on it and just focused on the on the sourcing part. Uh, when when COVID hit and like uh, yeah the remote trend started and companies like Facebook, Revolut, Twitter announced how many of their staff they expected to work remote in the future, we basically got the dust uh, from the file. Uh, 
as we say in the Netherlands, and we thought, okay, we still have this ID, um, and this could be the right moment to really execute on it. So now we're executing a survey also under uh, C-level uh, people from uh, startup scale-ups uh, on how and uh, what's their view on the future of, of remote work. Uh, is it something which is only stated by some of the brands and that gets a lot of marketing attention or is it an underlying trend? And with that research, we are actively going into the market to discuss with companies, hey, um, we can help you build remote teams here. This is how we've done it for uh, several other companies. These have been the learnings. If you want to build uh, uh, X, this is how, how it works. We have a report on the state of tech in Ukraine, which we can share with potential clients, which gives them the cost level, the challenges, everything. Uh, so they can very quickly see, hey, am I comfortable building a team in Ukraine? And then we can help them uh, uh, with it. So it was an ID that was basically activated by, by Corona. So, and is this going to be part of Matcher or is this yet another company? <laughs> no, this is, uh, this is all uh, within the Matcher uh, brand, uh, Mark. At this, uh, at this point in time, I, I feel I have uh, uh, sufficient companies. Uh. Fair enough. So um, I want to go back. It sounds really interesting and, and smart, really smart that you reactivated that idea and, um, you know, started marketing it, you know, straight away in light of what's happening with everyone working remotely. Um, but I want to go back to the, because I think entrepreneurs who have teams and have had to either furlough people or lay people off um, will resonate with the part where you were talking about how difficult that was be and also deciding, you know, how many people can you keep? How many people do you need to, do you need to let go? Uh, I can, and it's really affects people's, you know, lives. Um, it's a big responsibility you decided to keep more people than perhaps was financially prudent, which paid off when you then won TikTok because then you had, you were able to ramp up quickly for that account. But what was it? And, you know, then you're going back to people you've already let go to try and say, actually, we've got a job for you after all. Did, but were they not um, disenfranchised to that point? How did you win them over? Because they might have been feeling quite disappointed and, and, um, yeah. You know, how, how did you manage that, you know, that process? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, as I said, and this, this, I mean, I'm a big fan of, of transparency uh, and, uh, but especially Adrian uh, is really the guy about culture and transparency because in the previous firm where he was, uh, where he was a partner in the digital recruitment firm, uh, this was uh, <laughs> The last uh, thing that the company was standing for was uh, transparency. Uh, like Adrian said, for months they would uh, like uh, tell how um, everything was going extremely well at the company, and then uh, one week after, uh, people needed to be uh, needed to be fired. And he so. said, "That is not what I want to want to build and want want to be. I want our people." And I think also research has proven that that. At transparency and having them involved in the business is also better for uh, for their engagement. Yes. Uh, and I think it's also fair to people because they they commit to uh, to a cause, uh, so to say. So they want to know what's what's going on. So uh, what really helped us there is that people knew uh, our dependency on uh, certain clients. They knew for uh, for for booking Accenture and the, the the other companies what was the contribution to uh, to the revenues of of Matcher. Uh, so and also as we were growing of course it's always the challenge of balancing costs and and revenue. So um we were uh, by the beginning of this year we were uh, after the first so so we had the first year in which we were uh, we were loss making and then in January we got to the point that we were uh, operationally uh, profitable and people knew that but of course uh, in the beginning you're not directly extremely profitable but it's uh, uh, or well maybe for some people but for 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 our company uh, it uh, it didn't go like that but uh, it grows uh, slowly um so people knew that when we would lose clients uh, and we would have the same cost structure that we would be loss making again and people also could follow the news and know that 
uh, even though we had been loss making before uh, at that phase we were growing and we were also uh, we invested a lot in uh, a lot in tools we could have been profitable sooner if we wouldn't have been investing in tools but that was something people could understand and then they knew okay so this is for the time being and we can choose to be profitable but when when covid hit it was for everyone very hard to say okay when uh, when when will will um market activity pick up again and people also knew how uncertain it was so that it was a totally different situation so people knew okay uh, uh, they knew about the company that if we lose many clients we will be loss making and people also followed the news so they knew how things were going and we directly communicated about how does it hit us we shared uh, i think fairly quickly there was quite some research on on covid and the impact of the labor mar- on the labor market which we also actively shared with our team and so our team was very involved and they understood what was going on so we could show them the financials and say okay this is what we need to do and then we said okay we need to let people go but then people could still see that the pnl was uh, even when we let people go loss making so also the people that state could see okay uh, they are really investing in us because they want the people they believe in the business and then they want the the business to continue uh, so for people it was sort of uh, of course they they were indeed not if you let them go they were not very happy but they understand why we they understood why we needed to let people go and i think uh, also i think it was with with paul uh, helm that you spoke on the strength of culture Yes. Um, and then that's really when we had this. So we we called everyone one one on one that that uh, would they would uh, that we need to needed to let them go. And then we had a call with the whole team saying uh, whom we needed to let go. And then everyone, uh, including the people that were leaving, uh, were, they were all wearing their Matcher uh, t-shirts, uh, uh, supporting uh, the brand and and like. Um, yeah, uh, telling us that they wanted us to go through and then and, and hoped it would work. Yeah? So there was there was a lot of commitment, and there has always been a lot of commitment uh, from from our people. And that's that's and yeah, because they understood what we were doing and that this also wasn't what we wanted to do, uh, enabled the fact that when we asked people people to come back, that 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 they came back. Uh, Great! Wow, that know. must have been hard. Um, you know, it sounds like you managed it really, really well. And as, if people are willing to come back, then that it speaks, you know, to how how well you managed the uh, the whole thing with being very transparent and and uh, open with people. So great, fantastic, Martin. Well, I could keep chatting with you. You're an interesting guy, <laughs> and uh, I've really enjoyed this. But we're out of time for today. You know, please do come back. You know, again sometime, and we can talk about the next phase. You know, what the, the you can give me an update on what's happening at Matcher. Um, yeah. By the way, we'll put all your contact information in the show notes at recruitmentcoach.com forward slash podcast. But uh, if people are listening and they're not at their computer and they want to follow up with you, um, what is the best way of them reaching out to you, Martin? Um, yeah, the best uh, way to reach out is uh, is either by by email or by uh, by phone. Uh, <laughs> The the email I, I don't know should I should I say it now or do we share it in the in the notes? Um, I I'm I, either way yeah tell people your email address because uh, in fact let me first of all make sure people know how to spell your name because it's exactly I'm not saying it right <laughs> uh, I'm not saying it right it's uh, Martin with two A's so M A A R T E N uh, Vanderquack is three words V A N D E R uh, capital K W a A K. All right. Yeah. We'll we'll write it all in the show notes, as I said. But what's your email address, Martin? Yeah. So if they are interested in the mature uh, services, uh, it would be Martin. So M A A R T E N at mature.io. Um, and if they would be interested in the Apollo services, it would be Martin at Apollo Executive Search.com. Uh, and as you uh, rightfully mentioned, and as I know, uh, <laughs> From my international activities, uh, Martin van der Kwaak is not uh, the easiest name to. Uh, to, to I'm sorry. I apologize if I butchered your name. Um, listen, do you? Uh, one quick question: uh, Do you have recruitment companies who use your sourcing services, or is it all kind of corporate clients? 
No, we, uh, we also have recruitment companies uh, using our sourcing services. Um, one of the clients we, uh, we've been most successful uh, with is an, um, uh, is, a, is an IT recruitment company with, with over 200 recruiters uh, operating in, in three countries. Uh, they focus on the tech uh, domain. I think with them, uh, with, with us build, doing the sourcing, uh, we got to between three and five stable hires for them per month. Uh, wow. which which proves a huge value at uh, which was which was uh, ended um, uh, due to internal political uh, reasons uh, i know that many people uh, within the company disagreed uh, but uh, especially for for the te- i mean and that's also why we use it at apollo and why we started it from apollo because i think especially within recruitment agencies uh, the recruiters are often especially good at closing deals, uh, getting the candidate in, uh, ensuring there's a deal, managing candidate-client interaction. And they, do, uh, their key strength is not in the sourcing part. So if they outsource that, they can focus on getting the deal done. So, um, yeah, especially for IT recruitment agencies, and, and we've worked with various uh, of them. Uh, it's, also, uh, it's also, I mean, uh, everyone who thinks that 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 uh, they are not a specialist in sourcing and want to outsource that is a potential uh, potential partner for us. Great. Okay. Well, I'll I'll record a little commercial for you to add to this podcast, and uh, uh, when it when it's published, um, we can include that. But uh, thanks again, Martin. It's been really interesting. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for having me on the show, uh, Mark. It was. Uh, uh, as I told you in the beginning, uh, being, uh, being on a podcast is not my, uh, my, uh, my natural uh, pick, uh, but, uh, but I really uh, enjoyed uh, doing it uh, and talking, uh, talking to you about uh, the businesses and the industries. And I also, for, I really like that you're also testing uh, uh, the video outreach part. So I'll share, uh, I'll share the information on that uh, with you as well. And uh, again, uh, thanks, thanks a lot for having me. Oh, pleasure. Thanks again, Martin. Have a great day. You too.